other than Patricia and Nancy and I to put yourselves on mute. So that'll make all of our experience a little bit better. So what an honor, Patricia, to have you um, with us today. Um, you know, the thing that I, I'd like to start with rather than starting with why you wrote the book, which we'll get to, is how did you come to get into the field of community engagement uh, to begin with? I, I noticed your background in economics and regional planning, but community engagement, that's such a unique profession. Mm -hmm. Well, this gives me an opportunity to uh, thank both of the both the Academy and the NCDD viewers here, because uh, those um, David Bohm's writings and um, and the practices of NCDD were um, critical to my own development in uh, in community engagement. So um, so it's wonderful to be online with um, with some of you. Um, who represent that that development path and um, for me the takeaway from David Bohm was was that idea of wholeness interconnectedness and that is such a subtle and transcendent idea um, that goes goes beyond dialogue really it um, it's it's a worldview it's um, it's something that is heartfelt. It's a way of knowing that goes beyond the rational and goes deeper than the rational. It's kind of a heart knowing, really. Um, and so that was uh, formative back in the 90s um, in my approach to community engagement. And then in the 2000s, as I got into, as I discovered, found, and uh, got involved in um, um, the national, or what's it called, uh, NCDD. The, um, that was the focus on tools, um, tools and methods for engaging communities, engaging the public. And my field, which um, I teach in community and regional planning or urban and regional planning, um, is all about um, public engagement, and um, perhaps you could say a subset or related aspect to that is community engagement itself. I make a distinction um, because public engagement is often seen as a way for the government agency to sell an idea. Yes, <laughs> it is. I noticed that. <laughs> and uh, community engagement is um, is making um, keeping the value of um, the mindset of working with right. and listening to and learning from and learning together. Um, and so through my work um, in the US, um, but um, particularly in developing countries, um, my own ability as a facilitator of community engagement has developed over the years and critical to that development has been running into uh, practitioners who have learned themselves through experience how to really let go and let come with uh, the communities they work with. So. Um, so this, um, this book actually represents something that I think is just beginning to take off in professional education um, and particularly in our field of, com of community and regional planning. And that is professional education is more than a toolkit. It's a, it's a mindset and a heart set and uh, learning to reflect on our our own um, our own thoughts opinions reactions in the moment is a big part of uh, successful practice and without that self-reflection we cannot really be attuned to the larger unfolding around us of um, of the community or the system let's say that we're working with 
So the book is um, um, a means of bringing that awareness into professional education, um, giving it legitimacy, and using what I think is a very useful tool, which is stories. You can't preach this. <laughs> um, you learn it by doing, yeah. but stories are, um, are a very effective way, a very effective learning device. And so I've put, pulled together the stories from my own experiences and um, the experiences of the people I've, uh, the practitioners I've seen who have really gotten it. And uh, not because they just were wise people, but they learned the hard way by, by seeing what they were doing wrong. Yeah. Uh, or what was ineffective, and then um, and then realizing the need to let go of their tried and true um, methods and opinions and um, and goals. So that's um, that's pretty much how it relates to to my field. Uh, one other issue there, or one other connection, is. Um, it was my own um, kind of personal path in spiritual development, mm -hmm. uh, starting in the early '90s. That that seemed to correlate so so well um, with um, that inner practice of self awareness and the outer practice of of feeling, experiencing, knowing wholeness. Um, so that was going on at the same at the same time too. The um, I don't bring that up in the book at all, but it is um, an underlying uh, factor that was weaving through my own uh, personal development. Just one little anecdote at the end of um, class last spring, which was the first class that I used uh, the book in. Um, I used it as a kind of a training manual for the class that was going to go to Mexico to work with a, a low income community. And um, at the end of the semester, we were just uh, um, looking back on all that had happened. And, and one of the students said, uh, you know, Patricia, your book is really quite spiritual. And three other students jumped in and said, well, no, it's not. It's really a good book. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's very useful. <laughs> So practical and, and spiritual. <laughs> so I don't, um, I didn't bring that part of my own journey um, in it, but um, people who have the, can perceive that do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's both woven in the practical aspect mm -hmm. as well as the spiritual. Yes. And Indra, Indra's net, I was kind of curious uh, when and where you found Indra's net as sort of a guide and guiding principle for you? Oh, that was um, when I was working with my colleague in India, who was um, um, highly influenced by his um, his um, spirit, the spiritual teachings and his tradition, and we were looking for a symbol that would capture what we were talking about. Um, and it was actually my partner who suggested, uh, what about Indra's net? <laughs> um, Varun and I looked at each other and said, perfect. <laughs> it is, it's so, so that's, uh, that's where that came in. Thanks. So, so let me c turn you to this topic of deep democracy. Um, as I was reading the book, you would you would talk about it. I think you first talked about it in the story of Joel in South Africa and used the term there as deep, deep democracy. And so I kind of got a sense of it. And then as I kept reading, you would sort of ch add to that term and add to that term at each time. Each, each time I'd think, okay, I got it now. I know what it is. But, <laughs> but it, it just kept growing to the end of the, end of the book. So talk a little bit about um, deep democracy and how and what it is and how it figures in your work. Yeah, so deep democracy is something that people experience in different ways. 
um, depending on on um, on their growing edge. And uh, so that was what was so motivating in South Africa was to see the the story of um, Charlotte, for example, in a in Kailicha, a low income community on the outskirts of um, of um, Cape Town. And so she her her growing edge was realizing she was not a victim. Uh, realizing that she could um, she could take a step out of uh, victimhood by simply um, putting the word out to friends and neighbors to meet at the bus stop at a certain day to go and visit this nonprofit organization um, that was working with people like her. And that was such a, a life-changing moment when she went to that bus stop at the appointed time and found other people there. She had done that. She had found her agency. And um, so deep democracy involves finding our agency, how we can each make a difference, what is ours to do. Um, and then as she went on, it was, um, and she developed a, um, a, a group of uh, women who were doing the, the lending, the micro savings and micro lending to each other. Um, it was her heart opening. It was, it was the caring about each other. And then gradually it was caring about the larger whole beyond their little savings group. And um, she became a, um, um, a leader in a much larger grassroots organization. So, um, so that, was, that was her path of, um, along her path of deep democracy. And for all of us, it is that, um, that we're not the isolated individual and that we're not a, uh, just a consumer uh, making our consumer choices on the ballot at election time. Um, that it is up to us to um, find our voice and, um, and act and uh, sense that larger whole that we're a part of to care. And um, so, so that is um, an underlying theme in each of these uh, stories. Yeah. You know, I, I have a follow on question to that deep democracy area. Uh, it seems to me that it would be much, ha much harder for those elite to develop that sense of deep democracy, right? I mean, you know, you were, most of your stories are all about uh, grassroots people finding it and finding their voice and their power and sort of the spiritual aspect of that and finding their identity in through relationship, which is what I really got from that deep democracy area. But I would think for the elite, that's not so easy. Has that been Well, you know, um, each of these stories really focuses on the, the professional, the change, you know, the uh, facilitator. Mm -hmm. And these are people with, um, graduate degrees in many cases. And, um, and these are people with um, strongly held opinions of what should be. And uh, take, take the case of Joel in South Africa. You know, he, he knew um, in his mind, he was a professional architect and planner and now community engagement person. And, um, and uh, he was helping these people create homes in this uh, outlying uh, ex-urban ex area of Cape Town. And, um, and when they wanted to, to recreate um, kind of the middle-class dream of their own homes with a moat of land around them, as opposed to a, a more new urbanist vision of, um, well, creating space for, for retail, for community gatherings, for they didn't want to. They didn't want to um, 
he realized he couldn't sell that idea because one of the things he learned was you start where people are, right. not where you think they should be or need to be. And that was also um, the, the learning of David in the um, Colonia in South Texas on the Mexican border. Mm -hmm. You know, he had been a labor organizer in, um, in California with Cesar Chavez. And he came in with some hard driving ideas of what should be. And he recognized that that story is about his learning process of letting go of his idea of what should be and really sensing what was the next step for that community. And so he, he focused in on, on what they were interested in. That was um, learning English and, um, and getting their kids into and through school. But doing that, he became, he, he developed relationships with them and could go on and do, do more things. But each time he had to, um, he had to remember it's, it's their next step, right. not his opinion. Yeah. Beautiful. And, and Patricia, the, um, you, the book is also about your journey around that same issue you just talked about. And I just want to quote yeah. a couple of things fr from the book, uh, because you, you, in some places you're talking about yourself in the third person, that Patricia did thus and thus. And it, at one point, and this was near the end about South Texas, you said, I used active listening to reflect back in a calm words that there and if in a calm words their distress but it was not enough i did not get beneath the presenting problem and and later on you say i was focused on the end goal the deliverables rather than the buoyant energy field of the participants had created she can uh, she that you talking about yourself conveyed anxiety worry that they would not keep up with the schedule so talk a little bit about your own your own journey to do that same thing of the putting down Oh my goodness, there was a real disjuncture um, between my thoughts about, you know, the, the implicate order and the interconnected whole and, and, um, and the everyday of how do you um, manifest or, or, um, or catalyze that <laughs> awareness. And it was, um, um, the, the story from El Salvador is, is the story of my first immersion into participatory approaches. And I was under the mistaken impression that it was a series of recipes to follow. Um, but the, the inner element of um, the magic of the catalyst or the facilitator had eluded me. I didn't but I became aware that I was missing that mística, as they call it in Spanish. And that is, um, well, it's the work on yourself there to be uh, calm and confident and loving in the space of chaos or, or uncertainty. And that is so fundamental. Um, so that was a big part of my um, learning journey. And, and I refer to myself as Patricia when I am talking about who I was then. It's not who I am now. <laughs> so, um, um, but it was, they were such deep learning, uh, learning moments for me. And, and then I, of course, emphasize that, the book emphasizes that, the students learned that before we went to Mexico. Um, they even came up with their, um, own uh, mindful rules for action of um, kind of they had read mine in the last chapter or two they came up with their own about how to stay calm in in ten, in, in situations of unknowing of uncertainty of and and to stay open hearted in that and every evening we could discuss that and debrief from, from the challenges of the day and celebrate the victories of the day. And, and these victories were often personal breakthroughs of, you know, I stayed calm when, 
when it appeared like chaos. And um, I kept my heart open, um, even though I really disagreed with that one man, I could see his point of view. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and, and he became part of our group uh, as, as a result of my open heartedness, you know. So that self reflection is a really big part of it. And, and that thread goes throughout the stories. My own self reflection, other practitioners' self reflection. And along with the self reflection is the transformation. Yeah. Well, it is so, uh, it, it is so humble of you and, and open of you to share that story of your own journey uh, in, in the book. I really, uh, really appreciated your willingness to talk about the, what you had to overcome as well as what others had to do. My hope is that um, these stories and that openness um, and the reflective questions at the end of uh, each, each story will make it easier for, for instructors, trainers, professors um, to engage at that level and, uh, and be open themselves to encourage that openness and sharing at that level with the um, students or the trainees or um, people learning to be facilitators of community engagement. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you really have put a spiritual twist on a whole field of endeavor. I, I was really impressed with how you merged complexity theory with organizational development with social psychology. I mean, it was quite something, philosophy, it's all in there. And it made me wonder if this might not seep into, say, business programs. I mean, it's really a recipe for transformation at all levels in all disciplines in some, in some sense. Have you felt that, that it could cross, you know, from community engagement into other fields? This idea yes. of, yeah. Yes, I mean, I think it is kind of our, our calling at this point in history to really foster this transition. It is happening in many fields. Yeah. Um, and um, so this is one articulation of that. Yeah. And, and um, <clears throat> um, so it is in some way treading new ground, but I feel accompanied. Uh, in this transformation. It's really our, our kind of our historical calling at this moment. Yeah. And I, I love your um, coining the term ensemble awareness. I mean, that really kind of comes from a jazz point of view, right? Um, yeah. And it all seems to hang together with uh, Otto Schirmer's presencing, with Bateson's, what he calls spiritual knowing, and then Bohm's implicate order, wouldn't you say? It all right. kind of comes from the same place. Yes, yes, I do have um, a chapter or two in there that brings out the theory and the relevant literature and uh, you put your finger on it, those, those come together. But for me, the, the lesson was, um, became embodied for me in that moment that I describe um, in the opening chapter of where one of my students um, begins to sing in this old broken down church. And, um, and at first, you know, I could tell he was probing with his voice and, and I'm wondering, what is he doing? What is, what is he seeking? And then he found it. He found that, um, he found that tune or that, uh, tone that would resonate fully with the space of that old church and bring out the life of that church. And, and that's how he sang then. He, he made that space into a sacred space. He found the sacred in that space through his voice. So he was looking at the larger whole and seeing what he himself could contribute yeah. to bring out the best. And I'm telling you that there's nothing like a, um, an embodied experience of that to, to, to move it from intellectual knowing to that 
heartfelt, embodied knowing. Yes, yes. And, and also the shift from uh, problem solving. That's really what where most of us from the West focus our attention. You know, where's the problem and then we're going to solve it, right? Oh my goodness, to, yeah. to what's the potential here. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, that question of what is our value added? And we think, okay, we're experts in this, that, and the other thing. That's our value added. But really, and this is the message of dialogue, um, the value added comes first from, from listening and understanding um, what is present, what is unfolding, and what the generative edge is. So, um, so that's very different from fixing. <laughs> Well, I was also taken with the term ensemble awareness and, and in part because my, my, much of my background is, is a musical background and for many years sang with uh, small groups that were doing Baroque music where, uh, where if you had a, um, uh, um, an operatic voice or a solo voice, you really didn't, you couldn't really work with the Baroque music because there it, you had to be listening always to the other voices. So I, I kept thinking of that as, as you talked about uh, ensemble awareness that how important the, the listening is as opposed to one's own um, talent or voice in that situation. Right, exactly. I was also, you, you had so many terms in it that were really wonderful, but at one place you said, the facilitator becomes the instrument of change, not the wielder of the instrument, which is really a nice, a nice phrase. Can, can you say a little more about that, the, being the instrument of change, not the wielder? Yeah, um, we had a chance to, my students and I had a chance to experience that, um, uh, last spring in our field work in um, a low a low income informal settlement in Monterey, Mexico that had been slowly recovering from the the cartel wars um, and um, we went in with um, uh, we went in with the conscious desire to listen and see what was emergent and um, um, and it left us you know unlike all studio most studio courses you go in with a plan you you go in with um, a beautiful finding you know or results that you can write up and and present at the end of the semester we didn't know what was going to happen you know, we had presented a few ideas. The local NGO had said, oh, that's, that's too big for us, too big. Just come on down, we'll, you know. So we were there in the moment, seeing what was possible and, um, and, and where the next step was for this uh, community and its organization. So when, um, in that mindset, what unfolded was better than we could have planned. Mm -hmm. and, um, and as a result, and, and this is really critical, the result was the changes that happened um, as a result of those nine days in the field with them became owned by the local community. And on our last day in the field, they said, can we create a WhatsApp group with you so that we can show you what we do uh, afterwards? So um, that WhatsApp group is still going <laughs> one year later. And uh, they are so proud of what they're doing. From um, a non-organized, you know, kind of passive um, acceptance of, of what was, this part of the community is now organized and very proud of what they're doing. And um, so we come back and, and tell our colleagues, well, what is it did you do? Well, we helped them create a, turn a dump site into a children's park. Oh, isn't that sweet? 
<laughs> and, uh, but that was just on the visible side. The invisible was that community now believes in its own ability to make a difference and um, their own agency. And they are still going, you know, that, that former dump site is even more than just a children's playground. They use it in the summer for summer lessons for the kids. They, um, um, and they've learned to work together and they've learned to create together. So they are a, a working group now. They own the results. And I will say that is a major um, factor in when we evaluate the validity or impact of our work is we want to see if the people we worked with own the results and continue on, continue the, the spiral. And um, so that to me is the source of satisfaction. And along with that comes the relationship. We are still related and as soon as the travel bans are over, we'll be doing another uh, field, uh, field course with them uh, either in the fall or the spring because we have an ongoing relationship with them. So that, that one of the curiosities I came away with from the book, Patricia, was so could they could they have done it without the facilitators? In other words, you're you're saying they they did it themselves. They feel like they did it themselves, but yet in each case the facilitators were there. So um, help me with that issue. Could, you know what what yeah. do you bring? The, the presence of a facilitator, an outside facilitator, creates some, uh, some, some, some interest in a community, sometimes anxiety, some, and often, um, and we were asked this multiple times, what is it you're going to give us? Because the uh, assumption is some group coming from the outside is there to do good, you know, and bring resources. And um, every time they asked us, and it was multiple times, they kept grilling us on this. We said, nothing. We're not here to give you anything. We are here to work with you on what you choose to, uh, to be important. And uh, so for one, they said to us, you know, we hadn't felt that level of respect um, mm. before. So we bring respect. And uh, we had never been heard that, that well before. And um, so it's the listening. Yeah. Um, and, um, and it's the recognition. It, you know, it's like bringing new eyes and, um, and that feeling of, of um, it's like when somebody is observing you, you think, oh, well, there must be something interesting here that they're observing. Let me, let me live up to that. So it's, um, it's, it's subtle, the impact of the outsider. And there's a lot of fear because the outsiders often come with, um, with um, demands. Well, if you do this, then we'll give you that. And uh, so that is so different to come in and say, well, let's talk. Let's let's um, let's see what you what you're at, uh, what you're up to, what's um, um, what's unfolding, what's possible, what would make the most sense to you all, and it brings them together horizontally, as well in new ways. So, so Trisha, I had a related question to that. Um, you mentioned at one point how developing self governance um, requires the skills of dialogue obviously. How do you instill that? I mean, how do you t teach the people you work with the skills? Are you just modeling them? Are you holding the field for them? Or do you actually engage in some kind of teaching of the skills of dialogue? You know, um, I don't, when I'm dealing with the community, I don't engage in teaching of dialogue skills. When I'm dealing with facilitators or my students, I will um, stress um, and impart dialogue skills and not by lecturing so much as giving feedback on um, on our sessions mm -hmm. 
um, giving guidelines for intentional um, presence and engagement, and then um, having a, a review at the end of when did you feel heard, when did you not? Um, when did you really play a role in bringing out what was being said so that others could see? Um, how was your um, attention level, your, your listening? And when the two of you were talking together, um, did that person, um, did you feel heard? Right. You know, and so that kind of uh, feedback from doing, it is, um, so you can call it training. Yeah, yeah, uh, training by doing is what I'm hearing. Modeling, training by doing, and reflection. Um, right. A related question to that, um, you, don't you don't actually ever talk about psychology so much in your book, but you've got such great Jungian principles. I mean, holding the tension of opposites, you know, is such a Jungian term, right? Okay. Um, coming from the self. So I'm just kind of curious, were you familiar with Jung's work and did you make a conscious effort to kind of weave that into your sort of psycho-spiritual yeah, I think um, the, um, the the reading I've done um, is very eclectic, and um, and that spiritual development has been informed from by many sources, and and um, so the Jungian um, analysis is part of that. I don't have expertise in that. I'm just influenced by it. So I didn't even, I did not um, cite you. Um, and, uh, but you, yeah, have one, you, have one, you have one section in the book though, where you talk about the best community engagement um, professional has done their own inner work, right? Yes, exactly. That so, is, that is key. It's a key purpose to the whole book is to to um, elevate inner work um, to that level of um, acceptance and value for professionals. Right. That the skill building is is not uh, mechanical. It's um, it's it's the who we are as well as you know or or the being as well as the doing. Yeah. Um, I actually have one more question around uh, you, any work you've done in the United States around homelessness. Um, would your methodologies in your work um, be successful, do you think, as successful here in this country? Or are we just so individualistic here that it would be hard, harder? Oh, um, well, w one reason why I enjoy um, doing community-based work, particularly in, you know, around social justice issues, is um, that communities, low-income communities, get this better than, uh, <laughs> better than uh, high-income communities yeah, yeah. or professionals and uh, or highly trained people. It is, um, and so, um, yes, I've, I've worked with, particularly in the uh, Hispanic neighborhoods, I am bilingual um, in the U.S. I did also work in New Orleans after Katrina. I saw that. Um, yeah. So. So it's not, it's so not successful outside of our country. <laughs> right. No, it's, it's very, um, it's very important here and very, um, successful here and I think um, even when it comes to the traditional planner working for a local government um, who is tasked with um, doing public engagement I think the same principles apply and and affect the effectiveness of that um, of that professional planner in engaging the public you I don't know if you, you would be surprised to know that so many planners, um, our former students, are scared when they go address the public because they're scared of being attacked by an angry public. Yeah. 
uh, because they see the planners as part of the bureaucracy. Right. And, uh, and so how do you defend from those attacks? So public engagement amounts to defend, defense from attack. Um, but once, the, um, once you learn um, not just the, the mechanisms of uh, participatory engagement, but once you become, um, once you've done that inner work and can be there in the midst of controversy, in the midst of attack, in, and do active listening, um, say, with, um, in, in the case of a confrontation, um, and, and bring people together, then you can be effective as a community participation facilitator for a local government. And that goes uh, as well when you're working with a, a working group inside your own department mm -hmm. um, in the city to use those skills in, um, in your group meetings. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 th those are really um, critical skills for the professional planner to have. Um, and um, I know that the business world has been picking up on that um, for quite some time now. And uh, uh, it's time for other professions to do that too. Beautiful. Well, one last question, uh, Patricia. And I was gone for a few minutes. My, my, somehow my internet became unstable. So I apologize for leaving you for a few minutes. But I wanted to ask a question about women because it seems to me in the book that so many of the groups like this, the, the, the savings women that savings group and so forth. So many of these examples start with a group of women. So is there something special about that? That not all of them, I know, because some started with men, but is there something special about your work with women? Hmm. Um, yeah, it's um, women are, what I can say is it seems like um, it's easier to engage um, with women's groups at first because they're open to, um, to the ideas or the, that idea of um, the, the heart engagement, you know, mm. the heart opening and the um, nurturing um, idea and um, and so it um, it is very um, it is a lot easier to work with women's groups than than men's groups at, at first but um, but I, I would say that my the reaction I've gotten in um, not only in um, Monterey Mexico but um, but elsewhere and for many, many years of uh, work, the, the men also come on board, um, but there's a, a reluctance there that, you, that needs to be addressed. And um, so I think you've got your, put your finger on something. There is definitely a gender issue there. Um, I do not give up on the men. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, it did seem yeah. to me that, that some, I know some of the times you said the women started it and then brought the men in, that kind of thing. Yeah. But that also sometimes the women's issues were very fundamental around the issues you were talking about, about respect and about um, uh, what they could do in their own even families, you know, the, the disempowerment of women often, it seemed like. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, the... Um, the issue is present in um, in U.S. communities as uh, as well as um, communities in the so-called global South, and um, um, there is the change. However, is is happening, and uh, and I find the women leaders to be very powerful, um, and women's groups to be very effective agents of change. So we're going to ask um, now for um, uh, um, Bobby to put us in 
in these small groups. And Patricia, I think you'll be in a small group as well. Uh, so f to have a conversation for about 20 minutes and you'll get a notice right before, like one minute before you need to come back to the full group. So unmute, unmute yourself so you can talk in the small groups and, uh, and think about what Patricia said, what struck you, what interested you, your own experiences related to that. Uh, just have a, a good conversation among yourselves and then we'll come back okay. together in about 20 minutes. So Bobby, okay. send us into our groups. Nancy, can I have the, the video back? I don't, I think that's on your side, Rose. You'd have to well, turn it on yourself. Okay. No, I can't, says the host has stopped it. Hmm. Yeah, I think they were turned, the video was turned off and now we can't turn it back on. It's I'll do that now. I think Bobby's going to I'll have to do that now. Okay, great. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, I can't do it. Bobby's going to have to do it. No, it's not. Thanks, Rose, for letting us know that. Okay. And uh, before we get you into your groups, when you do come back, we're going to be asking you to post your questions in chat, just so you know. There'll be some time for that. And uh, then we'll be calling on you to actually ask those questions to uh, Patricia. There everybody is. I was wondering where everyone went. <laughs> okay. Yay. Ah. Uh. I, I got my time zone completely wrong. I'm sorry, Linda. <laughs> oh, well, I, that happens. I, I assumed it was six o'clock UK time and uh, maybe it's summertime that missed me up. But, uh. <laughs> well, you're in time for some conversation in a small group, and so you'll probably learn vicariously that way. <laughs> <laughs> Is everybody's video back on? Yeah, looks like it. Yeah. Okay. And actually, I, I see certain people are leaving. Um, we're going to uh, ask people to smile for a uh, screenshot so we can um, post your wonderful faces on our website. Bobby, this would probably be a really good time before we go off into separate groups, just in case we lose people. Sure. Um, so uh, maybe give us a one, two, three, and we'll all shine our happy teeth. Okay, so uh, one, two, three, everybody smile. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. And are you ready now to put us in groups, Bobby? I am indeed. Okay, thank you. So I guess, are we going, are you going to go into a group, Patricia? Um, 